Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I welcome you on behalf of the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce, the annual business luncheon. Uh, and I must admit, uh, my name's Ross Greenwood, I'm the business editor at Sky News, and it's my pleasure to MC this today, and also to be in conversation with our very special uh, guest today, the founder of Meriton, Harry Triggerboff. And uh, how good is it after a few years to be back here having a chat to Harry? So thank you so much, Harry. Can I welcome uh, you all here today on behalf of the uh, President of the Chamber, Mr Salim Nicholas, OAM, and also the Board of Directors uh, of the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it really is just a good thing to have us all here. Uh, also to Dalton House, to Paul Signorelli and his staff here. Uh, again, fan fantastic just to, again, be together, to be able to do these things in person uh, is really, after a couple of years, uh, such a blessing for us. Um, before we start, we should acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the country we're meeting on today. We recognise a continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting this coastline, this magnificent coastline that we sit on right now. And we pay our respects to Elders past and present and expend that respect to all First Nations people who are present here today. We also welcome special guests, including Milad Rad, the Ambassador of Lebanon, to the Consul General of Lebanon, Mr Charbel Macaron, to also Stephen Kemper, who is the member for Rockdale, and he's representing today the leader of the opposition, that is Chris Minns. Um, and Stephen is also the Shadow Minister for Small Business, Multiculturalism, and importantly today, given that Harry Triggerboff is here, and he'll no doubt get in his ear for property as well. So that will be very good. Many distinguished guests here today, many business leaders, uh, and welcome to one and all of you. Uh, the major supporters today for the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce, the Arab Bank Australia, and thanks to them for their ongoing loyalty and support for the ALCC, Diamond sponsors Tradelink and Etihad Airways, Platinum sponsors the Commonwealth Bank, Daikin, and J&J Metro West. Where's Johnny? Johnny, Johnny Magali's out the back there, he's got his table. Well done, Johnny, that's fantastic to see. Um, Energy Trade, Teco, Dulux. Dulux, the dog. Now, Dulux Dog, now I should mention, before I get to the Dulux Dog, Energy Australia. So now, this particular dog over here is one of a couple of things that we have. There's going to be a business card draw, so when that comes around, stick your business card in, please. Uh, and that is that the business card draw will be of this magnificent old sheepdog. Hang on, let's get him. You could be taking this home today, which could be rather Im impressive. Anyway, so it is a beautiful, as you can see, very well-tempered dog. It is really well-tempered. You can see this. Fairly moving, right? Um, and indeed, as the symbol of Dulux paint and the outstanding colours seen in homes across our country today. Many of you in the building industry will know that. You can actually take that dog home. Also, as part of the draw. <laughs> he's a bit fluffy, that dog. He's molting, I think. <laughs> now, Salim Nicholas is also, amongst these other businesses, has got the Tassie Distillery Collington Mill. And as part of the draw today, there will be a very limited edition uh, of their whiskey that they have here. So, can I just say to, thanks to all the sponsors, gold, silver, platinum, whomever you might be, uh, it's been fantastic. And you've stuck by the ALCC. Um, so I think that's pretty important. Uh, following lunch, you can also join the Chamber's directors uh, for more networking. I think that's code for drinks, um, frankly. You know, networking is always a code for drinks. At the Tribute Room, which is downstairs. The first drink is compliments of the ALCC and, of course, Dalton House. So can I now introduce the President of the ALCC to the stage, uh, Salim Nicholas, uh, to basically greet you, welcome you, and to get this thing started. Thank you. It's a big paper, but it's a short speech. Uh, good afternoon. His Excellency, Mr. Mirad, Milad Rad, Ambassador of Lebanon. His Excellency, Consul General of Lebanon, Sharbel Macaron. Mr. Stephen Kemper, MP, member for Rockdale, representing leader of the opposi opposition, Mr. the Honorable Chris Mintz. 
Consul of Lebanon, Mr. Raymond Shamlati, Mr. Harry Trigobov, and members of his family, members of the press, distinguished guests, and dear friends of the chamber. As many of you would be aware, the LSCC has a long tradition of community engagement, not only in fostering businesses opportunity between Australia and Lebanon, but also in charitable works here and abroad. There have been numerous significant challenges facing all communities throughout the world in recent years, none more so than the effects of COVID that led to many economic challenges compounded with distressing situation brought by the war in Ukraine. As we all know, every challenge brings with it an opportunity. Many of the individuals and companies represented here have contributed both in material and financial terms to assist the recovery efforts in here and abroad, and should take pride in the positive effect that this has led. In more local context, most businesses are struggling with the impacts of staff and material shortages. The resultant cost escalation and supply delays are the cause of great concern and have forced numerous businesses to contract their op operations and some may be forced to close their doors altogether. Coupled with high inflation, the usual uncertainty that precedes a general election and we are all facing some interesting times ahead. This is not to say that there is only doom and gloom in the foreseeable future. There are many positive signs for economic growth and business opportunity in the future. With, relax with relaxing COVID restriction nationally and internationally, we are seeing the first signs of a return to what can be called normal life. Increased community activity and businesses beginning to return to pre-pandemic office operations open the door to opportunity. Whether it is in small service business operation or the construction in industry, there is a light beginning to shine at the end of the tunnel. There are not many individuals who can say they've experienced as long and successful a business career as our guest speaker today, Mr. Harry Trigobov. Mr. Trigobov has seen many of the vagaries that we are currently facing, although his skill and determination has managed to establish an extraordinarily successful business in the Australian property industry. We hope that he can impart some of his wisdom and provide us all with the insight into what makes Meriton such a well-recognized brand in the residential property market. Thank you and welcome. I want to now take the time, if I can have some silence, just to take the time to introduce Harry Trigoboff. Now, Harry Trigoboff has been a guest here of the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce before. I've interviewed Harry, and if you've been here before, you'd know something of Harry's life story. Uh, a man who was born in Dalian in China um, and basically ended up emigrating here to Australia, uh, who started with a milk run, it's true to say. You had a milk run, in Chatswood, uh, the range of different things that Harry did. He was in textiles, he was an accountant, he learned all sorts of things. And eventually, he discovered that he had to be a builder, as the builder he was using to build some flats basically didn't do a very good job and he had to do it himself. And so as a result of that, he started to build. And the, and the name Meriton comes from one of his very first blocks of flats, uh, which is in Meriton Street, which you can go and see today, beautiful red block Red brick block of flats built in the 1950s, 60s? What year was it built, Harry? What year was it? Uh, 60, end of the 60s. End of the 60s, there you go. A man who survived the recession of the 1990s. More of that very shortly, I can tell you, because that's a good story. So it is with great pleasure that I get to sit and have a conversation with Harry Trigoboff. We've done it a few times, and I'm certain this one will be okay. Harry? Welcome. We're back here at the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce. Yes. All, all our friends, yes. All, all our friends are here, right? That's a good thing. That's it. Very well done. Harry Trigobov. Right. <clears throat> I want to start this conversation by coming to today. Right now, the most pressing thing that people are talking about in this room outside is interest rates. Clearly, inflation is rising. Interest rates are rising around the world. 
What's your view about interest rates? Is it going to hurt our economy? <coughs> well, interest rates have to rise because the, of the inflation. That's correct. So far, we are very slow, which I am very happy about, but I'm not an economist. I know that my buyers find it cheaper to buy when the interest rates are low now. But we, the, we don't have to worry too much about it. They paid before a lot more than what they will pay now, even after they rise. But they are used to paying low interest rates now. And it's hard to forget the nice times they had with low interest rates. But I'm sure that they'll adjust. On the other hand, it will also help a lot in leasing because it will be dearer to buy apartments because of the interest rates. So they will find it cheaper to rent. So the rents will go up. And I say that as the rents go up, the prices will follow. But of course, it all takes time. It's not <laughs> overnight. But that, that's the movement that I foresee. As a buyer of property with interest rates going up, do you buy now or do you wait and see what happens? Because clearly there could be some stresses if the interest rates go up too fast, too quickly. Well, what a buyer doesn't understand, but what really is the fact, is that really prices now are lower than they were three, four, five years ago. The fact that they dropped and now they're going up is another story. But they used to be higher, and they bought them at, that, at those prices. So I think that we will have to readjust. But the big answer is also that the costs of building are very high. So they will not be able to get apartments cheaper. As it is now, you know there are very few people that can build in this environment. It's not only that the council is bad, it's also the treasurer is bad. He wants money, council wants money. So it's very, uh, the costs of building are going up. So if they go up, the prices can't go down. It doesn't matter what the interest rates are because <laughs> if they can't make money, they won't build. They won't build, it will collapse, right. So. Are you worried about some of your potential future buyers in terms of their ability to afford your apartments? Um, because of interest rates rising, uh, their confidence, does this worry you about the way in which the, the demand side for property is going to go into the future? Right. So when I started to build, they, they told me, they laughed at me, they said, you're not a builder. I said, I'm not, right, I'm not a builder, but I'll pay the subcontractors. That's the main thing. That's all I have to know about building, and I'll get the right people. But, all right. So the problem was that I saw at that time in Australia that people had no money. The people you see now are a lot wealthier than what I had when I started. They had no money. So instead of going and becoming a public company, I went to the banks, got the money, and lent it to my buyers. And believe me, I lent to people that the banks wouldn't touch. But I believed in my property, and I knew that that property is good. So I gave them the money. And believe me, I didn't have bad debts. Maybe a bad debt if they divorced or but special cases. So I was very intrigued. How does it work? I'm talking now about the worst times we ever had in 73, the terrible times. And I go to a man and I say, well, you know, that guy sold the flat next to you and he took 10% less than you. Oh, he says, but mine is better. <laughs> Believe me, it wasn't better, but he's in love with it. So this is the strength that you have when you deal in property. They think that their house is the best and let them think so and help them. So with interest rate rising, 
is it time for property developers, property owners, to be wary of the banks? Is this the time you've got to be a bit cautious about what banks do in the future? <laughs> I'm wary of them all my life. <laughs> but, but anyway, when you're small, you have to have a bank or somebody to lend you money. So therefore, you must go to the bank. The way to play it safe is you have to turn over the properties quickly. Don't sit and don't wait for better times. If you bought, if you bought and you built, sell uh, when you're small. Later on, you can think, uh, discuss. But in, in the end, to, uh, today we have not only banks, we have other people that lend money. So between them all, I think it'll be okay. I wouldn't worry too much. So you have had that experience about what to do with properties if you can't sell them. And from that lesson of, you know, thinking about how do I, how, what do I do with these apartments I have, you created the biggest bank of hotel suites, hotel rooms effectively in Australia, Meriton Suites, where you found that three bedroom apartments were easier to let, you know, you're able to make more money out of them and you're able to use those apartments in your towers um, that otherwise at the time weren't able to be sold and it turned into a brand new business for you. Right now, you're building to let. So in other words, if you don't have people coming into those hotel suites, you can then build them and let them out to long-term tenants. So it's about having different means of being able to use those properties you're building. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so when we had the virus now, the government didn't know what to do with all the patients and the people that looked after them police and everyone. But I had service departments, so I could empty them very quickly because the people that go to service department go for short term and they were all furnished. So that was ideal for the government. I gave them 1,720 apartments. I'm sure they never dreamt of it and I never knew that I would do it that way, but it was very good because if I had to lease them outside, I wouldn't have got as much. And to sell would be very difficult. So it was good for both of us. So there you are, it just worked that way. All right, so take me back to the 1990s and the lessons that you had from the recession. That was a very deep recession in Australia. And that was about the banks changing their policies towards their lenders, calling in loans, this is the fear of many of the people in this room, property developers, many of them, business owners, and of course it's trying to make certain what happens if asset prices fall. We know it's volatile in the stock market right now. Just how do you protect yourself, you know, in, in the event that asset prices do fall? Right. So when you build, I decide I'll keep this or I'll sell it. But before I, I sold all of them, it doesn't matter, but the principle is the same. The smaller you are, the quicker you must be. So you sell it as soon as you can. When I started, we didn't even have strata title. We had company title. It was very difficult. It was a mess. So I used to build little blocks, six, eight, and sell them. And as soon as I was finished, I put in the tenant, and I got the money. And you have to be very quick. Always, unless you're very, very solid with your finance, you have to be quick. If you are very solid, you can take a bit of time. But the banks are very fickle, and they change their policies. And your manager might have been a good guy, and what he told you is the truth, but then they changed the policy. I had terrible ex uh, examples with Americans when they came here. <laughs> the first day they told me they needed me, next day they told me I was broke. I said, well, broke, or I'll send you broke. So I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> not simple, but... Uh, worked out all right, uh, we parted big friends and they, they honestly thought I was broke. So when I paid them back, they gave me two million do uh, pounds or dollars at that time, very long time ago, it was a big thing, a present, because they were petrified what would happen. I said, don't worry, the people need the homes, the homes are good, don't worry, and then we did it. Okay, so let's then go to something else that's topical right now. There are construction companies in Australia going broke. Condev, ProBuild, 
these are big, big companies that have gone broke building, um, you know, big buildings and apartment buildings here in Australia. Why have they gone broke, do you believe? Well, the way we do it is we do everything ourselves. So I buy the land, I have my architect, I build, and I sell. If see, you need money, I give you money too, but that's a small thing. All right. So we all have one aim, how to make the project succeed. When you have a company that then hires a big company like Land Lease or others to build for them. Land Lease is not going to go and fight the council. He wants to build a building. Give him a plan and he'll build you the building. With us, if the council doesn't approve what we want, we fight. And we usually win because we don't ask for stupid things. We talk logical. The weakness of councils is that they say, these are the rules. I say, but the rules are wrong. Change the damn rules. Now, we can't change the rules. So I say, well, so they're good. Then you go and you fight the councils because the planning department doesn't want to fight. He gave you the problems, but he puts them to fight for him. Now, they're very bad fighters because they don't want to fight me, you see. He wants to fight me, but scared. So you, you always win because <laughs> they're not going to fight for him and lose. <laughs> so do you believe that there are more construction companies that are likely to, to fail? And the reason is because many of them have had fixed price contracts, but costs are rising rapidly. Wages are rising. Building materials are rising. You know, it's becoming tougher. And if there are time delays, that becomes a, another difficulty for them. That, that, that is very bad, what you just said. See, they told people that they must pre-sell. So I pre-sell, my, my subcontractor gives me a price, and we're all locked in. And then things happen, we can't get the money, we, we not forget about the money at this stage. We can't get the material, the material went up in price, and the purchaser says, this is the price, I want the property. And this is a very big problem. And I really don't know that answer because I, I don't go like that. In, in my case, say if I pre-sell, I, I sell as I build, yeah? So, and if they don't want to give him money, the banks, I give him the money. So I believe in my product, so I'll give him whatever was the deal. And I must admit, and I'm a great admirer of all our subcontractors, that they can also carry on like I can. We can deliver. But it, it shouldn't be that difficult. The position in New South Wales is too difficult. It shouldn't be that difficult. I spent most of my time thinking how to get out of all the problems that they create. They make rules, and then they say, how can we work with these rules? I was sort of change it, so I can't change it. This is nonsense. So we all have to work and talk logically to them and hopefully they change in time. It takes time, but it'll happen. I promise you they'll change. Are you more confident in Sydney in particular because of the infrastructure that's being built, the new airport, the new city of Bradfield going in, the development of Parramatta, the development of Ryde? Um, do these new centres, do they give you confidence for Sydney into the future? I think that because of all these new areas, those are the areas which are very interesting. Because people now want to work from home. And to a certain extent, they probably will work from home. I don't know. So there's less demand for the offices here. If you see the shops, they suffer and all this. So these new areas is where we should look at. Like, uh, Parameter is extremely successful now in my service department much more successful than the city ones for that reason because they, they live there and they work there and they will have less working from home because it's quick for him to get there. So there you are. You, you have to take the opportunities and these are opportunities which should be taken in these areas, outer areas. And are these areas that 
you know, if there's any price instability, if prices start to fall, asset prices start to fall, are these areas that you will start to buy in to create land banks for your future developments? Well, <laughs> the land bank, well, the, I buy huge sites and very few people can buy them, if any. So they haven't got many buyers. So that's a special case. And I can settle immediately. I don't have banks, I don't have partners, I don't have boards. I say it's good, I buy it next day. It, very, it helps in these cases, right? But generally, <clears throat> we, like, I was in surface paradise for many years, I built there. Because these guys make me mad, so I go there to cool off. Not, not to make money, just to cool off on the beach. And just go and build in surface paradise, because you needed something to take the tension away, right? That's yeah. true, that's true, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I watched them, and for many years, the apartments never went up. And now, suddenly, they are very cheap. So that's why I bought land there, right? Because you have to watch also which areas are underpriced. Like the cottages in Sydney were underpriced. So that's why they went up. So this, these are the things that we developers have to watch. Okay, so then people in this room will be looking at you. And I don't think it's any surprise you are now 89. Nine. I was going to say 88. I was going to give you a year. But 89. A lot of people in this room are saying, hang on, but you're still buying sites, building stuff. You're 89. Many of these projects go way out and when you're 100 and 112, you're still going to be doing this then, aren't you? Right. <laughs> well, So I explain that to people. Explain how that works. I thought exactly as you young people, exactly the same. I remember a guy comes to me from Melbourne, a Jewish guy like me from China and Melbourne, and he tells me starting a project and he was 70. And I look at the guy and I say, oh, geez, how are you going to finish it? But don't worry about it. You have to plan for it and hope for the best, of course. Now, so I'm very close to all the people that work with me, extremely close. Now, you've been to my party sometimes, and you see I invite all of them all together, right? They're very important. So we work together, and I hope that they can manage to finish, because at one stage, I definitely won't be able to finish them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't finish them forever. So they'll finish it to the best of their ability. So I hope it'll be all right. And, and is that part of your role now? Is part of your role to teach? I mean, you've got a, a table here today of your family and your very close colleagues um, that are part of almost the family of, of Meriton. Is part of your role to teach those people how to do the things that you do? Or is there a, a skill in the risk-taking, in being prepared to actually take on the councils, take on the government, take on that block of land that might be available? Right. Well, so all these things don't apply to any place except Sydney. This is peculiar to Sydney. But why are we in Sydney? Because the prices have been here the highest. So if the price is high, you have more chance to make a mark. So that's the reason, otherwise nobody would touch it here. But anyway, so when I started, I had no staff. So I did everything. And then I took um, one man to do this and another one to do this. And I always found out that they were better than I because he did that one job. So he knew that job very much better than I did. And I said, if he didn't know it better than I do, I don't need you because I can do it without you. So they're very capable, all of them, in doing whatever they do, right? Now, of course, time will tell, but a lot of our, my assets are just bringing rent. Now, there is no big excitement there. You just wait for the market to go up and you make more money. And if it goes down, you wait a little bit, it goes again more. So there's always demand. There's never enough properties to rent. From the day I started till now, never enough. So, there's no, so that part should be easy. And this part, well, let them have some fun. 
That's exactly right. Let them have some fun. They'll work it out. That's exactly right. I want to ask you about one thing. You are a migrant to Australia and you've been highly successful. There are some people who would say, let's leave the country at 25 million. Let's stop here. Let's not do that. And of course, now our borders have reopened after COVID and the, the, the tourists don't seem to be coming in as quickly as we might have imagined that they would want to come to a place like Australia. Is this issue, the, the issue of migration in Australia, and many of the people here, of course, uh, the Lebanese community, you know, great migrant diaspora. So I just want to talk about that issue of migration in Australia and culturally how it fits with the way in which the country develops into the future. Well, I think that <laughs> we need more migrants all the time. If... Uh, we want to have respect from China, we must be big. Because if we are big, we can spend a lot of money. China grew because they could sell their goods to America. They couldn't sell their goods to America, they couldn't grow. They should remember that. And Americans must remember how it all happened. It's very important. So if we want respect, we must be big. I mean, if we'll have a few submarines, it helps. Of course it helps. But First of all, we have to make an aim to grow because a huge country like this, with so many resources, it's always very delicate. Everybody wants it. So we, we have that problem. We've inherited. Thank God we have it, but we have it. So that's how we have to do. Now, I think we did very well with migration. At the moment, <laughs> it's static. We are, we are all fascinated by votes. How many votes will we get this way and how many votes will we get that way? Well, let's hope that the election will be over and we'll forget about votes for a few years and get it going again like it should be. Okay, so then let's go to the votes. Let's go to the current election campaign. In your history, in your background, does it really matter which side of politics is in power in terms of being a property developer? Um, is it is it individual governments, both governments? Which, which, which way do you... It's not necessarily which way you vote. I'm not trying to ask you that. But I'm, I'm trying to ask you whether, as a, as a business person, whether you sense any differences between the political parties. Not really. Because they have advisors, and the advisors tell the same thing to them and to them. That, that's really what makes it <laughs> uninteresting, in a way. But the other part is this. In Queensland... It doesn't matter whether it's Liberal or Labour, they're both good for development. In New South Wales, it doesn't matter which party is in, they're both bad for development. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> they're very similar. They're being taught the same things. Okay, so then, if you're able to get control of the New South Wales planning department for a month, and you could change whatever you liked in that planning department for one month, what would be on the top of your list to change? Well, they've done one good thing, that they, we have a very good planning minister now, Roberts, very good. In fact, I think he's a damn genius, but then he doesn't look like one, but he is. <laughs> so, but he's very good. The problem with him, though, in my, I can't tell exactly, it appears to me that he's not given enough power. Now, if they only gave him more power, I promise you he could bring it all under control. And he is the only man that I know that could do it. So let's hope that that's what will happen. Okay, so when you go out to new areas, you know, height limits, shadow limits, uh, limits on building standards. Building standards have been a big issue, of course, across Australia, um, after, of course, the Opal Towers at Homebush. This has been an, an issue, of course, that you know, developers have had to deal with, uh, that owners have had to deal with. So it, there needs to be standards, obviously. You need to be building to standards. That's, that's important, clearly. But the question is whether there is just simply too much red tape to get to those standards. That's the important part, isn't it? So, probably it was too loose. But we have to understand, when I started to build, it was a problem to build two, three stories high. Now we go 100 stories high. 
we grew at a tremendous pace. So I think that the standards became lax. But there are two things to do. First is to fix the problem, and second, to make sure that we don't create a bigger problem. Because <laughs> the problem is not only for the developer, the builder, the subcontractor, but also for the buyer. Terrible. So it's not enough to say, this is wrong. The next step is we have to fix it. Because I assure you that many old buildings have as many problems as these new ones have. So, so we have to go and do it together. That, that's the only way we can do it. Otherwise, it can't work. Before we get to a few questions, I want to ask you one final question. It's actually, you know, they, I, I've asked, I always try and ask you a question I've never asked you. Like, I asked you once, did you like being called High Rise Harry? <laughs> what did you say to that? You said, okay, that's there fine, right? <laughs> yeah, right. This one I've never asked you before, but I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this. As I said, you were born in China, of Russian parents, and ended up in Australia. You've been, amongst other things, at some stage, Australia's wealthiest man. You are one of Australia's wealthiest men. You've built more homes than any other Australian has ever built. How many apartments is it now? Uh, 70, 80,000. 70, 80,000 apartments, right? That's how many you've built. Tell me what it is to be an Australian from your background and now from your pride as being an Australian. Well, <clears throat> well, I think that I was very lucky to come here. The, we, I came here before communists took over China. And in China, anyone who had money had trouble. And the white man, foreigner, really couldn't survive in those days. So I had two problems, wealthy and foreigner. So Australia allowed me in. So that was terrific. So I will be forever happy. Huh? Very good. Mind you, they made a lot of problems for my parents, which was quite, I would say, very bad. You know, Shouldn't do these things. But anyway, th that's what happened. So I'm, I'm very glad that I came here and I had an opportunity. And I was lucky. I found what I liked and there was a future in that. Because when I came, I did textiles. <laughs> and I said, our machines are very old. Our wages are very high. And the market is very small. There's no future. And all those uh, factories uh, all went bust. They were huge, uh, big factories, but it was out of date. So I was lucky that I found the right field and that I suited it. So that was my luck in this country. So next step about that, do you feel pride in this country? Do you feel proud about this country, about what it achieves, achieves the way in which it goes about its position in the world, even its position to its own people here in Australia? Of course. Of course, we should all be proud. <laughs> we don't have people running around killing each other. <laughs> and we don't have people starving. And uh, the standard of living is very high. So I think we've achieved a lot. We always want to achieve more, and so we should, and we should strive to do it. But I think this is a, an extremely lucky country. It is. We make mistakes all the time, but they're small mistakes, and we change. If we see it's wrong, if you work hard enough, they'll change it for you. <laughs> Common sense, in the end, prevails here. So this is a big advantage. I've got to tell you, it's always good to have a chat to Harry Trigoboff, because he's always just fabulous, very open, and the one thing I would find of the people I interview, not scared. And that's the important thing, not scared to have an opinion, not scared to have a view. So, Harry, thank you so much thank today. Thank you very much. We're now going to take a few minutes of your questions. So that's always an important part of this lunch as well. So if anybody has a question, stick your hand up right now. And I can't believe a room of this size will not have questions. And can I tell you that if you don't have a question, that young lady there, you're getting the first question. Yeah, you with the blonde hair, you're going to be asking the first question if nobody else sticks their hand up. So could somebody rescue that young lady there? Actually, they're not. Okay, she's got the first question. 
No, you are. Sorry. Yep, you're here, you're accountable. My partner. No, no, no. No, no, go for your life. I, I honestly have none. Everybody's got a question of Harry. Thank you. No, no, madam, there must be a simple question you've got of Harry. Right, sir, you've, you've just rescued the young lady. Thank you very much. Everybody should have a question. That's my point. Harry, first, uh, I would like to say that I'm honored to be one of Harry's family because I'm one of his contractors. And my business is here today because of Harry's and other people sitting in the room today. But what I would like to talk to Harry about today is what we faced in the last 24 months. What we faced in the last 24 months is, I'm gonna start with a phone call that Harry, somebody from Harry's office gave me on the first, on end of February 2020 at midnight. When Harry called that person and told him to call Charlie and see what's gonna happen to the towers because the government took a decision to close the borders. And that night, I replied that, <coughs> tell Harry to be comfortable because worse comes to worse, we already ordered 50% of his tower's material. We will ship them and we'll fabricate them somewhere here in Australia. The second day, when I called Harry's office, I said, looks like things is gonna be problem with, we're gonna have problems with our logistics. And to avoid that, we need Harry to support us financially to get all this material eight, nine, ten months ahead because we don't know anymore. We turned from 20 days delivery to Australia to four months, five months, we didn't know anymore. And it only took me to explain on the phone and send one email to Harry's office. He understood what's happening and the guy supported us and paid what he has to pay. And if we didn't do that, we couldn't be able to finish his towers. We are doing the biggest towers for him in Australia at the moment. And I think they are the biggest happening. And I can say that the only towers in Australia between 2020 and 2022 that didn't have problem and finished on time was Harry's Towers. Yeah. Fantastic. The question is today, the question that I wanna ask Harry today is with all the standards changing, and with all the economy turning to a circular, sustainable product that we need to use on our, on our facades, it's putting extra cost on our apartments. Putting extra, in our work, it's putting 30 to 40% extra cost. And with, as well, everything going up, we are short of skills, labor, government are not supporting anything at all. I feel sorry for my, our, the new generation, how they're gonna be able to buy an apartment or even rent one. Because I can see that product, how far they're gonna go and how much expensive they're gonna get and how much Harry or others, the facade that they pay me today, $30 million for it, it's gonna be 60 million in five years. And the end user's gonna pay for it. I need to see Harry, how he sees that thing's gonna affect the new generation in the next years coming. Thank you, Harry. Right. All right. So, first of all, I'm only as good as all my subcontractors and workers. Because if they are no good, I'm no good either. It's a, it's, a, it's a combined effort. Now, what you're asking is we must all the time argue. Now, I can argue more than others, because I've now told to a couple of councils, I will not start unless they change their conditions. So it's a standoff. I don't build, they don't get anything. But that's, that's a very, that, that's the last resort. But really we must all the time talk and reason with them. And believe me, if things get a lot worse, they will change so fast that you have never believed possible because they got the problem. You know why I believe in my business? I have two partners, the government and the banks. If we don't do good, they go b worse. Remember. <laughs> Very good, <brother. laughs> Okay, next question. Where's the next question? 
One right there in the very front. Thank you very much. Um, Sax Nassif, Holdmark Property Group. Harry, as an industry, we're proud of you. And we all feel the shortage on skills. Do you think we should, all of us as a property industry, lobby the government to spend more money on type and skill and support that skill, shor skill shortage? We definitely need more skilled uh, people. That's 100%. And uh, they realize it. But it's always politics for them. But in the end, we have to eat, so they forget politics. So it's only a matter of time. But it's very bad, it's very bad. I mean, the way we overcome it is we pay, we give them overtime. So if you give him overtime, he makes more money. So it works for you. <laughs> but I mean, this is really not the right way. But at this stage, that's what we do. And I'm sure many of you do the same. I'll take two more questions. Now, surely, in this whole room, there's not two more questions. One, yeah. There's one right here. Thank you very much. And it's a short and one. one just on one. Side. Uh, hi, Harry. Mark from TQM. Just a short question. Um, we've all seen the um, strong growth, especially in the last two years, in the regional communities, um, partly because there's been more awareness of the benefits there. Do you think this growth is sustainable? Would it be continued? Or is it just a result of uh, COVID? Right. Well, as long as they are so much cheaper than we are, it will continue. Because that's the advantage they have. And I think that they were so cheap that it was ridiculous. I gave you an example of Surface Paradise, and they were a lot cheaper than Surface. So they, therefore, they have to go up, right? So whoever got at the right time is very clever. But in the end, it will s settle down, because they all have to grow together. Origi like you take Parramatta, for instance. When I look at Parramatta 30, 40 years ago, it was nothing. But it grew into a big city now, so, but it takes time. But it was obvious because it was cheap and people lived there, so they would want to work there. So they also, it'll be the same here. Don't worry. And one last question. I think you've got that just there. Now I've got lots of questions. You see, this always happens at the end. Right, thank you. Rubal Walia from PwC. Thanks, Harry, for sharing the insights. Um, you're 89 years young. The passion's still there. What would be your advice in three things that you know, I can take personally in keeping my passion for what I like doing on. Right. So I'll tell you a story. I was about 35 years old. And I go in a lift. And the guy tells me, you've already made so much money. I mean, I made some money. Yeah? And he says, why do you still work? I say, I like working. I meet a guy when I'm 55 years old. He asked me the same question. I already made more money. I say, I still like my work. I meet a guy when I'm 80 years old. He tells me, Harry, I wish I worked like you. <laughs> Actually, now, you know what? We will take that one question down there. There was one question right down the very end. How's that for a question? You've got to like your work. You've got to do something, right, in this world. Oh, and I've got a second last question right down there. We'll take that one as well. Sir, right down there. Um, hello, I'm uh, Oli from Blue Ship Capital, and uh, I know that Harry, you're a great inspiration to a lot of people here, and uh, a lot of people would like to reach your height of success. So my question is, um, this journey you took, obviously, wasn't a simple work in a park, and you had to go through a lot of um, tough times to get where you are today. Now, what can you tell us about the biggest obstacle you faced on your way up? and how you managed to overcome it. Right. Definitely the biggest obstacle was because until 1972, 73, there was really no money here. See, that's why we learned to be fast. 
And in that time, 72, 73, the Americans came, Citibank, and they gave us money. So all of us rose at the same time. Alan Bond and I and Holmes the Court, we all, if you look at it, all the same. They gave us all money. And then suddenly, they needed the money in America. So there was no more money to have. Couldn't go to Australian banks, they still didn't have money. So that was a big problem, how to get out of it. Now most people either made some deals with them or ran away or whatever. I didn't do either. They couldn't believe it. I built more. So I said, now I'll give you more half-finished buildings. You go and sell them. Oh, oh, Harry, you are not fair. You, should, you shouldn't do this to us. I said, all right. So I built them. I sold them. I paid them back. But that was a huge effort. Believe me, that was bad. <laughs> if you think that one or two go broke now, that time they, they all went broke. <laughs> Right, and we have a last question, and there's a young lady down this end, down here, Michael, right down the side, uh, that I need you to go and find. I apologise. She got in in front of you, sir, so that's okay. And Madam down here, I apologise. There we go. This will be our last question. Hi, thanks, Ross. Um, it's Rachel Tweedy from NAB. Harry, um, I appreciate your time today. I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on the Building Commissioner and the legislation he introduced last year and the impact on end prices of housing. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping we wouldn't talk about that. <laughs> Look. Right. He is a terrific guy, I promise you. I never thought anybody could do the job as well as he did. Really? He was fearless, tireless. Right. So that is the good part. But really, there should have been somebody from the authorities who would work with him. Because he's a builder, you see. You show him a building, he says it should have been built that way. Right. But to fix it, there would be lots of tears and lots of heartbreaks, which shouldn't happen. There should have been a system where after he finds what is wrong, things will be fixed in the quickest, cheapest possible way. Because no old building is perfect anyway, and people live in them. But there's somebody that has to come, come and find a solution for it. He is the first step. But I hope that his work is not wasted and that the quality will improve, for sure, it will improve. So that's all I can say. Mm. And thank you for that. Can I now, uh, A, thank Harry Triggerboff. Thank you so much, Harry Doe. And can I now please welcome the Managing Director of EG Property Advisory Funds, and that is Dr Shane Gihar to the stage. Shane. Thank you, Ross, for, and thank you, Mr. Triggerboff, for a very enjoyable interview. Today, I think we heard two great themes from Mr. Harry Triggerboff AO. The first was about the futility of government and rules. When I heard him speak about how irrelevant and problematic some rules were, I was reminded of the words of the great Justice Sutherland in 1926, who invented zoning for the Western Hemisphere, who said, when I'm confused by so many rules, I try and remember just one rule. Salus populi suprema lex est, which is Latin for the welfare of the people is the supreme law. And I think that's what we heard today. The other great thing we heard today 
was about the importance of enjoying what you do. Here's a man who's nearly 90, who still loves every day he turns up to work. And that reminded me of the great words of one of the world's most famous engineers, Eugene Fresenay, who invented pre-stress concrete for all of us to use today. He said, far and away, the greatest prize life has to offer is the chance to work hard at something worth doing. Mr. Trigoboff, thank you for your wisdom. We really enjoyed it. You have our thanks. On behalf of the ALCC, please thank Mr. Harry Trigoboff, AO. And uh, Sam Nicholas, I think we need to have come up now uh, also for a few words that we're going to do now. So, Sam, thanks. Okay, I came ill prepared, but uh, I'll just let's repeat what Shane said and what everyone, I think, feels in this uh, gathering today, that thank you so much for being so open, so um, entertaining, so down the line, and so honest about your thoughts. Thank you again for this, your second visit to our uh, luncheon, and hopefully for many more to come. Ross, thank you so much. Very enjoyable. And very straightforward. I'm glad that you are our MC today. Just a small gift to me, to you, Mr. Trigobov, another one to Ross as well. Now, what I'm going to do is for business card draws and so forth that we've got to do, because I've got to race back, I must admit, and do an interview in the next 20 minutes or so. So I've got to run, but I'll leave it in your capable hands of Michael, who can do this. Who's going to do this? Peter Bender. Oh, Peter is going to come and do that. So do the business card draws. This will be good. Not now. In five minutes' time, enjoy some of the... Oh, there's cannoli on the table, for goodness sakes. I didn't see that. I would have stopped earlier had I known that. Anyway, so thank you so much for the day. Really appreciate it, as always. Have a great lunch.